Hello, you've reached Lisa talking again. So we have been looking at what broke Britain. I had originally done a series looking at what's keeping the UK stable and it's quite, you know, the world is kind of looking at us and many people are saying this country going, we've got no idea. You know, we are a very stable, democratic, modern, advanced economy. Now, the difference between economics and maths is that the context changes around economics. This is at the, at the core of both Friedrich Hayek and kind of John Maynard Keynes' thoughts, who are the godfathers of like 20th century economics. So this is not even a controversial statement. You know, when I started looking at this series, I was talking about the fact that some of the contexts that had changed around our economics, whether our family structure had changed from one of ownership to one where, you know, women are now market actors as well as having risk having care responsibilities the government has responsibilities to kind of provide regulation to the care economy the government has parental responsibility for a group of children these are all relatively recent changes but in actual fact it's it's quite difficult to kind of sit here because what i'm actually going to discuss today is corbynism and it's discussing how we get from this kind of relatively expected change where these changes have happened, where we need to adjust our economics, which is not a big deal. These are the systems that are central to meeting 21st century economics challenges. And instead, what I'm doing is a video which is actually describing how this situation, which was kind of highlighted by the financial crisis, illustrating the limitations of the economics that we'd been using. And this situation led to what rapidly became this generation's cable stream where the working class had to stand up together and say this will not pass to essentially kind of anti-Semitic democratic centralism which is the governance system that is that, New, that North Korea has and it's kind of like really strange thing to actually be discussing the journey from a relatively like as someone who's a looked who was a looked after child I had known that these duties would consolidate through this crisis thought so it would be a relatively straightforward process where the policies of austerity which were about stripping back at kind of these systems and using welfare system to undermine the rule of law I had assumed that that would generate fairly minor crisis as systems do and we would rectify it and instead I'm kind of sat here in 21 2021 discussing how this situation turned into very much this generation's cable street with the advent of Corbynism now what I discussed in the last video was the way that Labour had actually kind of constructed social movements it had actually nobody had realized that at the core of their identity was this right to subordinate people in social movements that they had been using this since you know this had combined with some very disturbing aspects of the labor identity which were actually pre-democratic they had there are people within this system who had completely believed that democracy was a temporary and b could be replaced by a system where the labor party bureaucracy took precedence over voters and mps and it's so surreal to be sat here discussing how this situation where the context changed around our economics and this policy reflex that had public support, that had cross-party support, there has never been a difference between Labour and the Tories on these policies and these systems that I am concerned with. Most of the people who deliver these systems are civil servants, so they are politically neutral by employment, or they are bound by confidentiality, or they're discussing marginalization and the rule of law, which is about consensus. So it's kind of weird to be sat here and be discussing how this developed in a situ into a situation which was essentially this generation's cable street, where we had to say, this will not pass. And now the Labour Party and the Guardian and kind of their associated cultures and institutions are, ex are imploding on Twitter. The turf war is embroiling the Guardian, you know, and they're caught in these circles. And it's quite a bizarre kind of thing to be sat here describing how this happened. Now, neoliberalism, at the core of it, was an ideology that was about individualism and deregulation, but it was also, you'll never find, like, the full story of economics just in an economics textbook. It's also about how policy will be delivered, how political consensus is kind of maintained and obtained. And up until very recently, in the last decade, it was a small number of newspapers who kind of defined a left-right spectrum. Most of us consider ourselves somewhere on the left or right spectrum, somewhere, you know, but actually most of there's more agreement than difference, I think. 
And these distinctions are not the entirety of most people's identity. But what we had not considered was that because we're a very stable country, over about 30 years, what had developed around policy making and media was a culture of people for whom this identity, left or right, was the defining feature of their identity and what made it worse. Because in actual fact, because they were kind of part of a media class, they had come to believe that they were above democracy, above the rule of law, and that this identity, left or right, was all there was. Which was fine until the digital landscape emerged where that those debate parameters could not be maintained and these people had to start mixing with those who deliver policy or are on the receiving end of it. Now I had discussed how Labour had constructed a fake anti-cuts movement, Labour and The Guardian, with the assistance of trade unions had kind of decided you could construct this fake anti-cuts movement where they would subordinate welfare claimants. The standard model was to kind of place themselves at the centre of organisation, say this is about the left, create environments where they could behave openly with impunity. And then kind of, as we saw with the... Um, with the, what, what I kind of was on the receiving end of at the end of kind of the response to trans rights activism when Karen Gala Smith and Ruth Sawatka, the, you would then see them lash out with all the institutional power that they had. I had a BBC producer, I had the police, like the Metropolitan Police stalking my blog for months. I was summoned to go and see them, even though I had literally not switched on a computer in months. You know, you see the level of institutional power that these people were employing in their narcissistic rage at vulnerable people. But they had been treating social movements as enclosed spaces because these people were powerless. And what nobody had realised till 2010 was this had been a core part of Labour Party functioning. But the neoliberal political and economic settlement had kind of begun in the late 70s and 80s and been generated by a series of crises, including a war in the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party at the core of this video, a man called John Landsman, who was at the core of the formation of Momentum. They had all been part of a war within the Labour Party that most of us are too young to even remember. And what we hadn't realised, we had, you know, it had been painted to us as like they were fighting neoliberalism. In actual fact, what they were fighting for was a democratic centralist model where party bureaucracy and their tiny culture would obtain power. But this culture had remained static over the course of 30 years because we're a very stable country. The rule, nobody has ever attempted to undermine the rule of law the way we did with austerity. Most of the systems that we have kind of developed through crisis, our trade unions have kind of a, 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 like a HR function within public services, within civil service institutions for social workers. They're a way to access legal defenses and stuff and tribunal representation, nobody had realised that what they'd actually done in this period of time, that this political culture had been acting as like a scab around the outside of our kind of media culture to prevent anybody going beyond these left-right debate parameters. And what we certainly hadn't understood was that this model of seeking out social movements to subordinate people had been a method of colonising other people's political resources and this had become a very wealthy culture but hidden within the confines of the Labour Party kind of structures and we certainly I don't think I had ever dreamed that this could possibly be the case. Now I had discussed how I'd been caught up in kind of the early at the early point of this social movement where they were just subordinating kind of these systems could never be discussed on a left-right parameter and in actual fact they truly believed that you know you could lift 30 percent of people out of democracy this culture who existed within these labor kind of uh, on the fringes of oxford university on the fringes of media organizations within the labor party within the guardian they identified as the representation of kind of the 30 percent of the most marginalized people in the country would react with narcissistic rage to those people saying, actually, we live in a democracy, I vote, I'm a swing vote, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't even understand what you're on about. 
But what we didn't understand was that because this culture had remained static since the beginning of neoliberalism, it was in fact Jeremy Corbyn and John Lundsman and men like that who'd handed Margaret Thatcher her mandate. They had then remained static throughout the life course of the neoliberal settlement. And at the point where that economics became kind of redundant and needed to be changed, they showed they had not moved since 1983 they still fulfilled that function and we ended up in a situation in this country which was ultimately like this generation's cable street the subordination and the abuse that i had seen in these social movements was turned inwards on the labor party momentum a way of kind of a centrally controlled way of managing a digital swarm to abuse whoever was turned into what most of us watched with horror like actual horror as a ground war opened up in the Labour Party. Um, constituency Labour parties all over the country were sites of, you know, abuse and intimidation where activists had, you know, the membership of the Labour Party had been opened up to three quid if you signed up online. And this tiny culture kind of who had existed since 1983 were kind of using that to direct kind of abuse and intimidation at actual MPs at local activists taking over local Labour parties one at a time and then using the bureaucratic processes within these Labour parties to establish a power base to wage a war on the parliamentary Labour party. Now by the time you got to, I can't remember, about 2016 or 17, we had started to see like Holocaust denial live on like, I remember sitting watching a party conference and Ken Loach was like, it was like actual Holocaust denial on the BBC Two at two o'clock in the afternoon. Now I'm just sat there going, what is going on here? Luciana Berger, a Jewish MP. These people identified like they're used in much the same way as they use kind of the moral authority from welfare cuts to justify threats and abuse and calling people murderers even though they were the media class who were seeking out welfare claims to stop the democracy and democracy so that our story would be uninterrupted they were using the situation in israel in very much the same way i don't think there are many people who look at the behavior of israel as a country and think it's okay there are certainly very few people i know who kind of look at the palestinian situation and uh, with anything but horror but this was very much distinct from this. This was people, this was a deep rooted anti Semitism within this fossilized culture, as well as danger to women. You know, this was a deeply abusive and aggressive kind of culture. And we watched as they used the pattern of an abusive spouse to take over a political party. And then began to generate kind of a celebrity fandom around this man, Jeremy Corbyn, at the center. Now, I had always, like, Jeremy Corbyn, as far as I knew, he'd been a lifelong rebel, you know, like, he'd rebelled against the Labour Party about 400 times, which I'll be honest with you, you know, we hadn't paid much attention to him, and all of a sudden, it was becoming apparent that this man's career, he'd never had a job, he had very much been part of this culture, he, you know, he'd made it in the he I think he was um, an official for a tailor's uniform I don't think he's ever been a tailor this is a culture who use other people's trade unions to develop political power and then he'd gone to parliament and stayed there for decades we thought he was a kindly old man it turned out the list of people like you know this man had been seeking out like some very violent and disturbing people and inviting them to parliament over years and years and years but the problem was that this fossilized left-wing culture that he was the symptomatic of, who'd also handed the mandate to Margaret Thatcher in kind of, you know, they had been behind kind of the, the worst Labour election victory ever. Jeremy Corbyn had also been the head of the Stop the War Coalition. What they demonstrated with Corbynism was what they had done with the opposition to the Iraq war. Two million people had marched against the Iraq war and these men had siphoned off this kind of opposition so that it would be neutralized while generating political kind of bases for themselves. I've got one of the advisors. This is the kind of mentality that you're talking about with these people. I started to realize something was wrong. This was a comment made by a guy called James Medway, who was the head of the New Economics Foundation. So these are people with significant power. He was also the advisor to John McDonnell and he says, um, 
If there's a failure to represent that roughly one third of the English public who are significantly to the left, so what they had been doing was identifying like the, the third of people that they were supposed to be representing because by virtue of trade unions, you know, this third of the country, you know, welfare claimants, people in various systems, people who are very vulnerable, they identified as their representation, but this is the key. <laughs> Where is it? It says, the greater a constitutional crisis can be provoked inside the UK, the greater a chance we have of establishing something outside of the Westminster Circus. Like basically, they at one point John McDonnell was talking about how he'd waited a, a lifetime for this opportunity. They saw austerity as an op and particularly uh, uh, Brexit, no doubt, as an opportunity to cause constitutional crisis because they believed in a democratic centralist model where Labour Party bureaucracy would supersede voters and MPs. This was absolutely staggering. So before we knew it, they've not just kind of subordinated welfare claimants to a policy reflex that killed 100,000 people will go on to uninterrupted. The power that's been gained from that, they turned on their own MPs, on their own activists, part-time Labour activists. They waged a grand war in the Labour Party. They started targeting journalists. We watched as like Jeremy Corbyn beamed while his supporters hissed at a BBC journalist. Um, Jeremy Corbyn himself would kind of follow very, very narcissistic patterns. He would like, you know, where accusations or admissions, anybody who discussed the very long list of very dangerous and disturbing acquaintances and people he'd mixed with was obsessed with him. Anybody who discussed the anti-Semitism but that by this point was becoming openly expressed was obsessed with him. Um, John McDonnell was saying that anybody who criticised Jeremy Corbyn was an enemy, like, and basically encouraging violence and abuse. Um, in the weeks after Joe Cox was murdered, momentum, this kind of astroturf, kind of digital, kind of shoal of abusive kind of people, were targeting MPs as traitor of the week after an actual Labour MP had been murdered by somebody shouting traitor. That's essentially your boss targeting you to shout traitor at you two, three weeks after your colleague has been murdered by somebody saying the same. Um, we, we kept being told that Jeremy Corbyn ob objected to personality, not politics, but everything was about Jeremy Corbyn's personality. Descriptions of his actual actions would result in incredibly disturbing, you know, he, he was discussing the way that um, it was a simplistic, facile and misinformed media debate, even though the systems that we were discussing actually couldn't be discussed on a left-right kind of axis at all and he was subordinating discussion of those systems to his own identity if you then contradicted false statements about this personality you were making it about personality now in kind of i think at one the while this is ongoing there are several crises that are ongoing one of them is that universal credit has been rolled out which is completely non-deliverable it's ended up costing about 20 billion quid it was an attempt to assert complete control over the working population who were contained in our benefit system. It was too many people. It wasn't compatible with housing. If I ever mention it, I get people underneath saying I'm on it. Like it literally guarantees homelessness. There had been no opposition to this because labor cut, because welfare cuts were labor policy too. I had been to a think tank meeting in 2013 where Stephen Timms had laughed at the fact that it was undeliverable and the the meeting was hosted by a company called Aviva who were proposing replacing all these systems with a financial literacy app. This is what Labour's plans for welfare had been. Now I've put underneath a documentary, a vice documentary looking at Jeremy Corbyn and if you go to about 30 minutes in you'll see how he responds to, Ger to Ian Duncan Smith resigning in protest at kind of draconian welfare cuts. So this is the actual Tory welfare minister resigning because these welfare cuts are too much. And he literally doesn't bother, he ignores it completely. He actually, um, he's given an open field to challenge the Prime Minister on it and he chooses not to. And he just carries on like it didn't happen. Because once they had the political capital for austerity, the focus was on them replaying a war in the Labour Party, which was about democratic centralism.
Now, there was an incredibly tumultuous summer where there were two major tragedies. One of them was the Manchester Arena bombing, which I find difficult to talk about because it's actually only half an hour from where I live. And I will be forever grateful to Ariana Grande for handling that the way that she did because there are lots of children around here who are not scared of that arena in a way that actually really upsets me walking through Manchester, Victoria. There was another where a tower block burnt down. Um, which was an incredible failure across building standards, across the relationship between local authority and tenants and social housing, which demanded discussion of the economics that we'd been using. And Jeremy Corbyn kind of executed a perfectly executed media strategy over, over both, subordinating both to Labour's needs. And quite frankly, if I could find makeup for, which did for my skin what these tragedies did for his demeanour that summer, I would buy it. You know, a cult of personality was developed around him that summer. He, he appeared at Glastonbury. You know, there were, you know, hordes of kind of people who were his fans. Like, literally, this was fandom. Buoyed by the, the kind of moral authority that came from opposing welfare cuts that he hadn't opposed as justification for being able to abuse and target whoever they liked. In the days after the Brexit referendum, where we needed a shadow chancellor to project to the world that we were a stable country, the Corbynites were summoned to Parliament Green to basically have the equivalent of a public riot. We needed a shadow chancellor who would show that we were a stable country. This was about our economic future. They saw an opportunity to provoke a crisis and instability. Because in John McDonald's own words, he had waited generations for this moment. This was their shot. It, when you kind of describe it, looking back, you kind of like, you know, we hear a lot about the threat of extremism. Actual working class people in this country were horrified by this. By the time you got to the last election, they had a digital strategy where they had rolled out the right to abuse anybody at will to like literally Facebook groups, buy, sell, swap groups across the country. The Calder Valley Labour Party here, I live in a tiny market town, like literally I live in a tiny idyllic market town. They were sharing anti-Semitic propaganda and abusing and intimidating people online for saying that Labour actually hadn't opposed welfare cuts. People who actually understood welfare policy couldn't, like basically the aim of Labour's election campaign was to prevent people who had already been through a policy reflex which had killed 100,000 people. I'd had malnutrition three times. You know, I had been absolutely kind of at the brunt of this in absolute abject poverty. And Labour's aim was to stop women like me being able to participate in public life during the election because they wanted to pretend that they had opposed welfare cuts that they had not opposed. Now, what became, like, I think the final straw in the election was that there was a protest. There, there were some Jewish people who kind of stood up and said the anti-Semitism that's coming out of the Labour Party is disturbing and we are frightened by this and who wouldn't be? And Labour instructed their support base to turn on these people and to flood digital outlets to say that this was a lie. And we kind of ended up, I think Labour got 32% at the last election. And all of a sudden this fossilised little culture who had been kind of over 30 years stability had colonised the trade unions of social care users, of welfare claimants, of civil servants who had basically spent 30 years seeking out any social movement about anything to colonize it and prevent people accessing democracy, had amassed such resources behind the kind of closed doors of the Labour Party and the Guardian that they literally, the entire working class had to say, actually, this will not pass. And it became this generation's cable street. Now the Labour Party can't ever be elected again not you know it's not just about the iraq war it's not just about austerity it's about the fact that as an organization they had fostered this threat within their walls and never dealt with it 
you know, what we were talking about was elite educated young men. When you looked at the kind of system around Jeremy Corbyn, it was his son who was working for him. It was, it was operating like a dynastic system. You know, when you're talking about the amount of money around these people, you're talking about trade union leaders who are on hundreds of thousands of pounds a year as payment for preventing these trade unions ever in the course of the neoliberal settlement representing any of the workers or particularly the vulnerable service users within our public sector systems. And they had created a fiefdom. The only way to access the inner circle of this culture was to be from, you know, the very, very uh, Oxford University, the social circles of kind of Jeremy Corbyn's son and John McDonald's son and these Oxford students that I had met when Labour had originally manufactured this kind of subordination of welfare systems. And so you sit here and we, you know, we should have had, you know, the context changes around economics and our social care systems, our looked after system, our welfare system reflect that change. These are the systems that are central to managing our 21st century kind of challenges. We need to change the way that we use data in these systems. We need to start using the data that these systems produce. And instead, what I'm discussing is how a fossilized culture within the labor pie with only one with only one function, which is to divert discussion of anything into left right parameters, had fossilized so much that not only did they facilitate kind of the, the deaths of about 100,000 people, they intimidated journalists. We saw, you know, members of parliament being routinely intimidated and abused. We saw them wage a ground war within the Labour Party and within parliamentary institutions. Some of the discussions that I heard about the way Momentum people had behaved in kind of various groups around health are actually staggering. You know, The Guardian have been waxing lyrical for 30 years about how the threat of extremism comes from the working class. This was clearly narcissistic projection. And instead, what you've got is this tiny culture of, you know, not very many people rooted in elite institutions who were at the core of the neoliberal settlement. What they've demonstrated over the last kind of 10 years is that their function for the last 30 years has been to disenfranchise people and the toxicity that that has generated within their culture has kind of come pouring out since 2010 and has led to literally the global economy being jeopardized us pole vaulting out of the European Union you know and massive consequences you know the difference between economics and mass is that the context changes around economics and what you see with Corbynism is the dangers of having a media culture and a political media culture who only have the single function of preventing anybody recognizing that changed context.